What role could the colonies of bacteria and other microorganisms in our bodies play in cancer prevention? How about the role of Schedule I controlled substance cannabis in shrinking tumors? And how does a compound first found in soil bacteria in Easter Island make the body more tumor vigilant? Dr. Dwight McGee sheds light on these and other aspects of the big picture of cancer prevention, treatment, and aftercare for Cancer Safeguard Part 2. At the dawn of his career, Dr. McKee was already treating stage four cancer patients with holistic medicine before choosing to train as an oncologist, a conventional medicine cancer doctor. Why he took that step will surprise you, as will the results he's seen in merging holistic and conventional medicines to treat cancer. Welcome to Vital Signs, where we learn how to get healthier from all angles, from the biochemical and nutritional to the things we do that nourish our minds and our souls. I'm Brandon Fallon. Dr. McKee, welcome back to Vital Signs. Thank you, Brendan. Great to be here again. Functional medicine is one term that seems to cover the targeted nutrition, the repurposed medications, the mind-body medicine that you've used effectively in your practice. What is functional medicine exactly? And why did you also go on to train as an oncologist? Allopathic medicine and pharmaceutical medicine is great for acute care. If I'm in a car accident, I want to go to a hospital that has great surgeons and great, you know, infectious disease specialists and so forth. But when it comes to complex chronic illness, those therapies are not useful and often harmful. You know, you need to work with people trained in natural healing, functional medicine. Functional medicine is an approach that instead of trying to make a diagnosis and then treating that diagnosis, they're looking for root causes. So they're looking for heavy metal toxicity. They're looking for nutritional deficiencies. They're looking for evidence of infections with, that, that can be carried by ticks that can mimic all sorts of other chronic illnesses. They're looking for toxicity in many different compartments and measuring it and prescribing detoxification systems and intervening in the diet. When I went through oncology training, I'd already had 12 years of experience with natural healing in cancer, and I was able to help about, significantly help about 20% of the stage four patients. And when you say help, Dr. McKee, you mean that they saw a... Get them functional, keep them stable, keep them from dying of their cancer. I've had patients that have had tumors that were stable for over 20 years, and I've had people with tumors that all disappear. That was early in my career. I think later in my career, I was doing quite a bit better than that. But the reason I decided to become an oncologist is that every time my patients who had an oncologist would go see them, any that had metastatic disease, they would come back and just completely, you know, well, I went and saw my oncologist and he said, well, that's great that, you know, your appetite's improved and you have less pain and your tumor's a little smaller but you have metastatic disease and that's incurable and you need to be sure your affairs are in order because, you know, don't kid yourself. You're not going to live beyond six to 12 months. And these are, these are actually hexes. These are curses that are put on people by well-meaning, but unconscious oncologists who only believe their training. And I practice as a general practitioner for, for 12 years in an integrative setting. But after a while of seeing the damage that oncologists were doing to my patients psychologically, and the psychological is a huge domain in, in cancer, I decided I needed to be an oncologist. And there's virtually no training about nutrition. There's no training about repurposed drugs. There's only training about the application of chemotherapy and targeted agents that have been through phase three, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trials. They're part of the armamentarium, another military word, of the oncologist as they wage war on the tumor. So I kept very quiet about my prior 12 years because I was there to learn what they do. And I I've, I've found the judicious application of conventional oncology uh, techniques can be very useful. It can bring down the tumor burden very dramatically. 
conventional oncology techniques. What, what do you mean by that? Can you give chemotherapy, it a chemotherapy, chemotherapy, targeted agents, mm -hmm. radiotherapy. I don't think I wrote about this in um, my paper, but I found that cannabis is a very potent synergizer. It makes the effect of radiation against any kind of tumor much more effective and it protects the normal tissues. And people only need to do it for about um, 12 weeks. Typically radiotherapy is given over six weeks and then its effects are going on for another six weeks. And so the, the period of cannabis in which they're high every day, not for everybody, but people that are comfortable with that or can tolerate that, uh, it dramatically improves the response to radiation therapy. Unfortunately, we probably won't be able to do clinical trials of that until the federal government changes uh, the classification of cannabis uh, from Schedule 1, which means it has no medical capability, although, you know, 36 some states, uh, 30, well, 30 some states have medical cannabis, which would imply that it does have, you know, medical benefits. And it, and it clearly does in a, a whole range of issues. There are some doctors whose their entire product practice is cannabis based. I'm surprised. I mean, with all everything that's happened in terms of legalizing marijuana, cannabis for recreational use, that it's not it hasn't made it easier for it to be available to be used along, alongside radiotherapy. You, it's really hard to do clinical trials when it's at Schedule 1 federally because if a patient comes from a different state, they can't take the cannabis home with them. You can't send it across state lines. It has to be produced within each state that has it legal. You can transport CBD that has less than 0.3% THC, but to get the effect I'm talking about with radiation therapy, you do need some THC. In reading your paper, I observed that one of the reasons that the evidence hasn't been so obvious for the effectiveness of supplements in treating cancer is that where they have been effective is often where they've been used as part of a system in conjunction with other treatments, maybe even medications. But can you give an example of a, a, a supplement that you have used effectively in this way as, as part of a system with other things. Well, I, I, I would never do a clinical trial of a single supplement. And when supplements do get clinically trialed, that's the way they get clinically trialed. Curcumin has gone through studies, the uh, extract of the turmeric root has gone through a lot of trials at MD Anderson because of the interest of that Professor Agarwal, one of their scientists, had in it. But I never treat a cancer patient with one or two or three or four supplements. And my day job for the last 20 some years has been as scientific director of a nutraceutical company called Life Plus. Our major markets are in Europe, so it's not very well known in the US. But when I formulate a product, they always have a lot of ingredients and ingredients that have synergy. And I'll use plant extracts preferably to isolated vitamins, because they contain so many chemical compounds, each of which has many, many dozens, hundreds, even thousands of targets. So when I provide supplementation to a cancer patient, the supplements themselves are complex. And then I would typically be using a dozen different ones. <laughs>